Thank you so much. Gracias, Laura. Uh, I would like to, hello, everybody. I would like to thank AgeList for uh, inviting me to this conference. And in particular, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Sang No, uh, Dr. Yan Sukim, and to Dr. Laura Arce, and to Dr. Anjali uh, Jansen, and, and to the Peruvian uh, contingent and uh, for their work, for their hospitality, and for their kindness. Thank you. Thank you very much. When I received the invitation, I was, of course, worried about how I could contribute to this conference. But when I saw the actual title of, the, uh, of this year's conference, Identity and Well-Being, I felt relieved as my current research is, I think, directly related to these two keywords. What I'm currently working on is the analysis of the representation of domestic spaces in American literature. Um, the research started in 2018 when I became the principal investigator of a project funded by the Spanish Ministerio de Economía, Industria y Competitividad. The project was titled Troubling Houses, Dwellings, Materiality and the Self in American Literature, and it lasted uh, three years, finishing at the end of 2020. Uh, the project was so exciting um, that together with my colleague, Dr. Cristina Alcina, also from the University of Barcelona, uh, we applied for a second project, for this one project, um, that would enable us, will enable us to work until the end of 2025. Um, we have been fortunate enough to be granted this second edition of the project, and the title of the new project is On Housing, Dwellings, Materiality, and the Self in American Literature. And it's funded by the Ministerio de Ciencia e Innovación very generously uh, to our shock. We're still shocked. They gave us the full amount that we applied for. So uh, uh, <laughs> uh, if we don't do well, it's because uh, it's our fault. But we, we are well funded. Um, this is our project. And uh, as you can see, there are 16 of us in the team. We come from nine different universities in four different countries. Uh, Spain is represented, uh, Universitat de Barcelona, Universitat Jaume I de Castelló, Universitat de Valencia, UNED, and uh, Universidad Complutense de Madrid. Uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the University of Sussex, Ireland, the Clinton Institute of um, University College Dublin, and the United States, uh, Southern Connecticut State University, and Eastern Washington University. Uh, we, the question is, why did we get together as a team rather than do individual research? And uh, well, because all, all of the members um, of the team share two passions. We are all specialists in American literature, and we are self-confessed domophiles, uh, lovers of domestic spaces. Um, we sometimes comment that when we meet somebody, Normal people wonder about their sexuality or their income or their whether they have children or not or uh, their political views. We always wonder, what does this person's house look like? <laughs> um, does he have a, like a reading corner? Uh, those are our questions. Um, so at, at you know at the at the uh, academic level and at the gossip level, you know, with houses. Um, we share the same disease, basically. Um, now, what you can imagine is that when we started our project back in 2018, little did we know that our specific object of investigation, domestic spaces, would become not only uh, the focus of the world's attention, <laughs> but the world in itself with the arrival of the COVID pandemic, uh, as we were forced to go home stay home and look at our home for entire months and to look at ourselves in our homes and to examine the relationship that we had with our domestic space one day and the next day and the next and the next um, also when we started we had no idea uh, how widely the project would open to domestic spaces uh, beyond the house um, which we had not even considered initially, just as a few examples, uh, some of us have been looking at the literary representation of the ship um, as a domestic space, 
for those workers, the sailors who live in them for months or even years at a time. Um, as you know, Foucault, for instance, um, claimed that um, the ship is the heterotopia par excellence, he said. Um, Arturo Corujo, one of the researchers, uh, works on Melville's ships, especially the frigate in White Jacket. Some of us have analyzed the literary representation of the prison, uh, which may be an unlivable space, uh, a living space not of choice, but which is tragically um, a domestic space for hundreds of thousands of uh, people. And Eva Puyuelo analyzes the women's prison, especially in Asata Shakur's autobiography. Asata Shakur was a, a Black Liberation Army um, fighter. Um, some of us have analyzed the street um, for those people who find themselves in a street situation, uh, people who do not have a house, but who still consider the street their domestic space. Uh, Cynthia Stretch is actually working with slam poets who produce oral poetry in the city of New Haven uh, about their homelessness. Um, so, so we're working with oral literature as well. Um, besides those spaces, we also analyze the convent. For example, Christina Zina works uh, on the Jesuit um, monasteries in, in Willa Cather's fiction. Uh, mobile homes, Carmen Manuel has been looking at uh, adobe houses for migrant workers, or um, especially in Woody Guthrie's uh, novel, um, with a prologue by Johnny Depp, really interesting. Well, we'll talk about it. Um, and um, well, of course, John Steinbeck's the the Okies, and um, and also uh, some of what well, one person, Christina Garrigos from UNED, is analyzing uh, the facilities, the living facilities for those people who live with Alzheimer's disease. Um, um, she has just published an entire book about that. Um, people whose lives are very much determined by um, the spaces they inhabit, both the space they leave behind, whether it is physically or mentally, tragically, or the, the, the new space, the medicalized space. Um, we are surprised by the scope of the spaces that are covered by the notion of the voluntary or the involuntary realm of the domestic. Um, I want to talk to you today about our research because uh, no matter in what shape uh, they come, domestic spaces are directly related to our well being, both physical and mental, and also, of course, to our identity. Uh, for it is in our domestic spaces that we surround ourselves with our favorite, personally meaningful and meaning bearing objects in which we are invested emotionally and effectively, and also because the size, the layout, the location of our dwelling is immediately read both by ourselves and by others as clear signifiers of our social class, as well as our, our oftentimes ethnic origins, our education, among many, many other factors. Besides our uh, individual publications, we produced our first collective uh, volume, which is uh, titled American Houses, Literary Spaces of Resistance and Desire, which is about to be published by Brill. Um, and uh, besides that, we have organized numerous conferences and symposiums and panels and roundtables and lectures, both in, the, in Europe and in the US. Um, what is our research? What questions do we ask? And I'm going to focus on five uh, questions. The first one is, what are the ideological balances of cohabitation in the domestic space in terms of family, lifestyles, gender, and sexuality? And how are those balances actually determined by the space um, itself? That's the first question. The second question, it's again, these are genuine questions. I mean, these are our like first <laughs> questions. Uh, the second question is, why is the actual diversity in the composition of human households, why is it not reflected 
in, um, in, in our houses, given the uh, uniformity of our domestic houses, is most houses tend to look very much alike or when you want to rent or even buy those who can uh, find that the market is very limited uh, in, in terms of options and possibilities. It's not very creative. So is the fact that most people live in standardized, predictable spaces indicative of the fact that we live standardized, predictable lives? <laughs> Or does it mean that those um, standardized predictable spaces um, only allow us to contemplate standardized predictable lives? This is a question that the Swiss English philosopher Alain de Botton um, addressed in his book, The Architecture of Happiness, already in 20, uh, 2006. Uh, the question was, is architecture a diminished reality obviously because of the material conditions and the market, or does architecture diminish our imagination of possible living arrangements other, <laughs> living arrangements other, other types? The third question is, what is the relationship between the house a subject inhabits and the past? Both the historical past of the house itself and the personal past of the subject. And I'll come back to this in a minute, hoping to connect with history <laughs> here. Um, the fourth question is, to what extent is the relationship between the inside of a house and its exterior, the community, nature, world, uh, one of connectedness uh, in either obvious or unforeseen aporias, or one of attempted and of course failed mutual exclusion. And the fifth question is, um, is the domestic space an actor in a larger social system of production, reproduction and transmission of conservative ideology? Or could it be a site also of potential resistance to it? And here uh, we're working on, on Hannah Arendt, of course, for whom the house is not only precedence, but also destination. The house is where we emerge from, but also where we go back. Um, in etymology, as you know, um, uh, the origin, I mean, the, the, the word, the Latin word was domus, and domus takes us to domination. Um, uh, in Greek, the, the, the word was oikos, which takes us to economy. So is the house domination and economy <laughs> only? Is there anything else, please? Um, so the house is where we emerge from to enter the polis, the agora, the political and uh, the ethical because of exposure to the diversity and the plurality of the world, we exit and we come back. And uh, as Judith Butler would argue, we do not live. We live with, um, in the community. So as, as Jacques Derrida uh, claimed, and this is him speaking, he says, we are never fully at home or we shouldn't be. Uh, or in the words of uh, Theodor Adorno, in Minima Moralia, and I'm quoting him, it is part of morality not to be at home in one's home. So the whole ethical dimension here um, permeates everything. The relationship between the domestic space and ideology is complex. On the one hand, it is obviously a place of um, familial and familiar <laughs> indoctrination into the hegemonic, in the hegemonic beliefs of the culture regarding class, race, sexuality, etc. But conversely, um, as Bell Hooks, African American uh, thinker Bell Hooks, has pointed out, uh, it can also be a space of resistance to that hegemony. In her case, for example, she believes that the, that the house is the, the space where African American mothers can teach their kids ideological resistance to the hegemonic racism of 
the street. Um, our team addresses these and other questions by analyzing a number of relevant uh, representations of domestic uh, spaces in American literature over the past two centuries. We go back, I, I am a 19th century person, uh, so we go back to the beginnings because as you know, already in 1854, uh, Henry David Thoreau had declared in Walden, and the quotation is, most men never appear to have considered what a house is. Uh, with that text, Thoreau makes us reflect on the question of how each one of us would live were we to live deliberately. <laughs> and what would be a good house for each one of us if that house should or could respond organically to our necessities, our yearnings, our aspirations, and not those imposed of us by uh, mainstream society or culture. Uh, like Thoreau, many other renowned uh, American writers have considered what houses are, and particularly what houses do. And they have created uh, fictional dwellings that function not only as settings, but um, as actual central characters in their fictions. Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry James, William Faulkner, Willa Cather, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Toni Morrison, Sandra Fisneros. I mean, the list is um, very long, to name just a few. And the writings reflect the centrality of the house in the American literary and, I would say, political imagination. Our research owes much to pioneering scholars, and, and here I'm going to name just one, uh, and that would be Marilyn Chandler, who in 1991 published the book Dwelling in the, in the Text, Houses in American Fiction. And uh, I'm going to quote her. Uh, it's a long quote, sorry, but I think it's interesting. Uh, she says, these are her words. It is hardly possible to cast the mind's eye over the broad landscape of American literature without seeing a series of imposing houses rising in curious shapes along its horizons. Thoreau's cabin at Walden, Walden Pond, the dreary house of Usher, the house of the Seven Gables, Uncle Tom's cabin, Edna Pontellier's pigeon house, Gatsby's mansion, uh, the lonely and defiant house of Faulkner's Thomas Sutton, Cheever's suburban Cape Cod, or more recently, the haunted white clapboard in Toni Morrison's Beloved. Our literature reiterates with remarkable consistency the centrality of the house in American cultural life and imagination. In many of our major novels, a house stands at stage center as a unifying symbolic st structure that represents and defines the relationships of the central characters to one another, to themselves, and to the world, and raises a wide range of questions, starting with Thoreau's simple, what is a house? Our novels are about houses and homes as much as they are about the people who inhabit them. And this is the end of the quote. Sorry, it was long, but I think it's rich. Um, over the last three decades, a number of publications uh, have focused on different uh, specific aspects of the relationship between the American house and the American self. And we hope that our research contributes to the field. Um, the thing is that we are um, espousing our <laughs> research to other disciplines, and we are drinking from borrowing, uh, lifting, stealing from other disciplines, uh, especially uh, human geography, uh, domestic space studies, which is uh, an incipient discipline already, uh, thing theory, uh, queer temporalities and queer space, of course, queer phenomenology, and here Sara Ahmed is it's kind of like a guiding voice, uh, materialist ontology, and uh, we also use powerful uh, instru instruments, uh, 
tools such as the concepts of uh, biopower by Michel Foucault, necropower by Achille Mbembe, um, dispossession, Judith Butler and, and um, Athena Athanasiou, hospitality and the arrivant, uh, Jacques, de, uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, spatial politics of affect, Nigel Thrift, spatial violence, which is a very interesting concept, spatial violence, Anthony uh, Widler, and carceral topography, Monica Fludernick, and unhousing, Paula Gay. And I'm, I will, uh, I'm, that's where I'm going. I'm going to unhousing, to this, to this concept. What does it mean? Uh, the team members share both a hypothesis and an approach. Uh, the shared hypothesis is the, the, the domestic space plays a crucial role in the production of subjectivities. And that, in fact, as Paula Gay suggests, and I'm quoting her, subjectivity both constitutes itself and is constituted either through or in opposition to the space of the house or the home. Um, that would be the hypothesis. In terms of the approach, our shared approach is the avoidance of the metaphorical understanding of the notion of the home. Um, our research in that sense is very different from uh, post-colonial questions about finding home in the world or about being a home, the notions that Homi Baba or Walter Mignolo play with. Uh, we, we don't go there. We don't go to home. We, um, what we do is we look at the materiality of uh, the house or the dwelling in American literature. And we are concerned with the structure, the organization, the objects inside the house, and argue that the space defined by rooms and their contents both influence and um, influences and expresses the consciousness, the imaginations, and the experience of the humans who inhabit them. Um, Although we still have a long way to go, we have four more years to go, the results are bad, bad. Um, and you can see this in the change of titles from our first edition of the project to the second. Our first project was Troubling Houses. And we, we, we use this concept, Troubling Houses, because houses are supposed to be placid, pleasant spaces. Um, for instance, um, human geographer Linda McDowell wrote um, or had presented, I'm quoting her, the home as a haven, providing security, safety, and certainty in contrast to wider social insecurities. Sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, as you know, defined the home as, quote, the circle that stays warm, however cold the winds outside. And in his very famous, very famous, The Poetics of Space, philosopher Gaston Bachelard uh, stated that, and I'm quoting him, the house, it's very poetic, it's beautiful. He says, the house shelters daydreaming, the house protects the dreamer, the house allows one to dream in peace. Uh, if this is the case, if this is what the house should be all about, our question is why are the American houses represented in literature so troubling or so troubled? And that's why we moved to the second edition of the project. Uh, and the title is Unhoused. Um, and we are not trivializing when we use the word uh, unhoused, we are very much aware that there are millions of human beings that live without a roof. Um, we don't want to demolish the house, uh, but we want to dismantle the power of the hegemonic definitions of the house and of the domestic. Uh, in the same way that we are deconstructing the masculinity, we're not, we don't go around killing men, but uh, we, we are interested in, in, in dismantling the hegemonic notion of masculinity. It is about time that we do the same thing with the domestic space. Um, we are fully aware 
the, the dream of the house, both as an ideal and as a reality uh, that is actually unlivable, as we will try to prove, has historically been a nightmare for all those affected by violence or violences and discriminations related to sex, class, color, ethnicity, gender, and or sexuality, both in the unlivable uh, domestic space and um, more specifically in the actual lack of access to it for those who live in a state of dispossession, destitution, or uh, homelessness. We also believe that the domestic space has been and continues to be the site of a disciplinary regime, uh, which has come to be specifically hard on those non-normative subjects who have had to live in what in the queer art of failure, Judith Halberstam refers, refers to as the discomfort of home. As Leslie Robertson states, I'm quoting her, people may feel homeless at home, trapped in a space of tyranny, oppression, or persecution. Hegemonic representations often overlook the violence, dislocation, and social exclusion that shape the lives of those whom Julia Wardo calls domestic refugees and also gender or culture renegades. As Wardo writes, those who are not able or choose not to conform to the gender, class, and sexuality ideals inherent in establishing a conventional household find themselves symbolically and often literally excluded from any notion or semblance of home. Uh, unfortunately for many people, as one of the characters in uh, Ia Yassi's novel, Homegoing puts it, Sometimes the evil in the world began as the evil in your home. One of the premises of our research is that in those cases where the um, reality or simply the ideal of a socially sanctioned um, domestic space proves traumatic, hurtful, or antagonistic to the constitution of free subjectivities, it is better to opt for a process of what Paula Gay referred to in 1993 as unhousing. Uh, and the first time I found this um, word or this concept was in this article um, from 1993. And Paula Gay just uses this word twice very rapidly. And um, she says, um, Um, that unhousing is a movement to the margins of the relatively stable structures of society. And she also talks about the uh, un unhousing as the process of the deconstructing of a unitary grounded subjectivity. Um, 17 years later, in her analysis of the exclusion of queer subjectivities and sensitivities from the premise of the domestic, meaning here both the national and uh, the dwelling, um, Sarah Ahmed, in the promise of happiness, also used this word um, and, um, in this sentence. A revolution of unhappiness might require an unhousing. It would require not legitimating more relationships, more houses, even more tables, but delegitimating de de the world that houses some bodies and not others. The political energy of unhappy queers might depend on not being in house. Um, if unhousing is understood as a gesture of refusal of those constricting, traumatizing, and damaging definitions of what a domestic space is all about, 
then unlearning both individually and also culturally um, our ideals of the domestic space may hopefully result in freer subjects within what we might contemplate as not only living but livable uh, spaces as well as in more uh, sustainable hospitable and above all else um, habitable uh, communities um, the texts we work with um, prove that old paradigms need to be questioned um, as those paradigms put domestic spaces dwellers and relationships and material belongings at risk um, those texts the texts we work with um, um, prove that those paradigms need to be pulled down so that new houses new subjectivities can be constructed too um, and with the hope that um, we can construct new bonds and hospitable domesticities that are not dependent on owning or renting or even residing in an actual physical house it is precisely the dissolution of the traditional idea of the american house that it enables the characters in these novels that we work with and plays and poems as well um, to negotiate instability we live in a very unstable world world so the, the fantasy of stability is what proves to be more damaging than the confronting the non-stability uh, that uh, that we that we live with every day um so hopefully we can create alternative permeable and actually habitable spaces based on the acknowledgement of uncertainty leaving behind narratives of fixity and of permanence and opening up to the community and to a greater experience of the larger world i i hope that we are being honest with our research in the sense that hypothesis uh, that unhousing this this concept that i'm presenting here today it, it was not a hypothesis it, it was never a hypothesis of ours um, it is not a, a theoretical tool that we have imposed on uh, our reading of literature. And housing is our first finding, is uh, our first result from the materials that we have been working with. Um, we, um, the motivation of our research was and is the hope that it illustrates the necessity and the benefits of integrating materiality and housing research into the field of literary studies and that it encourages exciting new work that makes us rethink uh, of where and especially in its connection to how we live uh, habitats are both sites and aspirations and uh, we strongly believe that thinking of where and how we live may help us also think of who we want to consider aiming to uh, become. A few bullet points um, just to talk about things that we have been uh, finding and that we have been surprised by. Um, we got what one question was regarding the Americanness of this project. Of course, this project could be based on, you know, or work with Spanish literature or you know, Galician or or what, any British literature, whatever. But um, we found that one of the Americannesses <laughs> of the project is that, and this is a big surprise to us, out of the 24 um, publications that we have out there. 18 of them so two-thirds no 16 of them deal with african-americanness with the african-american uh, experience of domesticity starting with the house divided <laughs> the racial the racial america um, permeates 
any discussion of the domestic and of the of the house uh, the house the notion of the house as the plantation the ghost the the spectrum the that that the legacy of the terror of the house in the African-American imagination. Um, it's a fault line. It's a bad foundation. It's a ghost. It's a presence. It's a spectrum. And in the same way that Toni Morrison famously um, talked about how the white literary imagination was haunted by what she called the Africanist persona, um, the same thing happens to the American domestic imagination it is very often defined in opposition to what the unhoused homeless jailed ghettoized and or unsafe experience of african americans uh, have had with with houses and which today has a very clear shape which is the prison industry um, as as you know uh, the second bullet point or thing that I wanted to mention is uh, our defense of literary studies and or cultural studies to analyze the domestic. Um, and in conversation with architects, because of course we, we work with architects, so we, we, we know we, we are finding rich provocations uh, from, from us to them, from them to us. But for instance, the Finnish architect um, Juhani Palasma has noted that the meaning of the house and this this comes from a professor of architecture says um, the house may not be a nation that has a notion that has to do with architecture he says <laughs> that the house has nothing to do with architecture as much as it does with sociology psychology psychoanalysis and in that sense, it is more revealingly portrayed in poetry, fiction, cinema, and painting than it is by bricks or you know or you know, structures. So interesting coming from an architecture uh, from an architecture professor. I think that it it works both ways. Uh, reading literature allows us to see how imagination shapes interiors. But analyzing um, literature also allows us to see how those interiors are shaped by the imagination. Um, to history, um, from the most obvious, which is the notion of uh, Foucault's heterotopia, uh, we have moved to another Foucauldian uh, notion, and that is um, heterochrony <laughs> other, other times. Um, and you know Foucault talked about spaces that make us connect with other times. He talked about the, the graveyard, the cemetery, the library, the museum, the fairgrounds. Um, well, what we have discovered is that houses are not episodic, that houses are sequential and they engaged with they engage with and they are engaged by history and here i would like to refer you to um, bill bryson who asks the question and i'm quoting him what does history really consist of centuries of people quietly going about their daily business sleeping eating having sex endeavoring to get comfortable. And where did all these normal activities take place? At home. Uh, for Bryson, and I'm quoting him, houses are not refuges from history. They are where history ends up. And here, uh, there are two important trends uh, within the connection between history and, and domestic space studies. One is, uh, what is called house biographies and um, house biographies tell the story of a house through the lives of its past and present inhabitants so the home is interpreted as a site of history and memory and in the uh, case of britain there are many uh, projects uh, one is the project living with the past at home domestic prehabitation and inheritance 
um, which looks at that. Another example, again, in the British context is um, the book by Julia Meyerson's Home, the story of everyone who ever lived in our house. And uh, it, in, in that book, she traces the lives of 18 generations of residents in a house in South London that was first built in 1872. So that's something, uh, house biographies. And the other kind of like line is housing careers, which records the series of dwellings a household or a person occupies over time. And that is very interesting to see whether there is a pattern in the kind of houses and aspirations that we have or our understandings of, of, of the domestic. Something else that we are looking uh, that, you know, that, that is shouting at us from, from the materials that we work with is the whole notion of liminalities, as you can imagine. Um, not of the house, not the borders of the house or the, or the entryways or the windows, or, but the liminalities of the human. <laughs> um, first of all, the, 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 the limits between the, the human animal and the non-human animal so the domestic animal, the pet, is very important in the texts that we're looking at. Um, the relatedness between the human animal and the non-human animal, um, something very important in politics, as you know, in the US, no president has occupied the White House without having a dog. That's impossible. I mean, you have to be married to a woman. You have to be a man. You have to be married to a woman and you have to have a dog. I mean, otherwise, no, you, no. Um, the other thing is uh, domotics also regarding the limits of the of the human, which is, you know, more and more important now. Uh, the house making decisions for us about our uh, food or our diet or, our, you know, imposing a, a, a kind of like a a regime of um, yeah, lifestyle. And uh, thing theory, which is very strong, uh, our relationality with objects within the field of, of, of material um, studies. Bill Brown, who is the big name in thing theory, says, and I'm quoting him, fiction demonstrates that the human investment in the physical object world and the mutual constitution of human subjects and inanimate, inanimate objects exceed commodity relations. There's something else in our relationship with the objects that, that are not objects, but things because we are invested uh, in. Um, so that's worth looking at. Uh, ability and disability studies uh, is in the conversation, of course, regarding the domestic um, and phenomenology, for sure phenomenology, and most of you are familiar with Sarah Ahmed's um, discussion of orientation, and uh, not only sexual orientation, but like physical orientation. She looks at the table and how when we grow up, we are, you know, sitting around the table and we face our father or our mother or our sister, our sibling, but that orientation, that shapes, <laughs> that brings us together in a very specific way, and it limits or uh, what we can actually contemplate uh, within the uh, familiar and the familial, uh, both. Um, how are we doing? I mean, are, are, are we doing five minutes? Five minutes, okay. Uh, so just to finish, what I would like to do or not do uh, is to talk a little bit about my my personal take on this. I mean, what I do, I, I, I do Herman Melville. <laughs> so I have, I have not been looking at the ship. I have been looking at the the, the prose, uh, the, sh the short stories. I have been looking at uh, four short stories by um, Melville that are about houses. Uh, and the houses are not the background or the setting. The houses are protagonists. Um, very quickly, I'll tell you, I mean, what they do. in the piazza is a story about a man who has a house and who in, in the fields and he would like to have a piazza and he would like to have the money to to build a piazza around the entire house Four sides doesn't he doesn't have the money so he decides okay and he builds one facing the north and everybody's like i mean 
this is Massachusetts. Are you, are you crazy? Why the North? And he says, no, no, no. I mean, I, I like this particular view. And then he sees a house from that piazza. He goes to, he fantasizes about that other house, goes to that house, tries, something could happen between him and Mariana, the, the woman who lives on the other house, but then he retreats back to the, to the piazza, which is both a place of exposure and of safety. So it's very interesting that architectonical uh, aspect of the house. I and my chimney, another story by, by Herman Melville, is about the chimney. And the chimney is, is a huge chimney, central in the middle of the living room. And the narrator's wife and daughters want it abolished because it's crazy. You know, it occupies so much space and it's ugly. And, and he says, no, over my dead body. This, I mean, no, because this is a um, centrifugal place. I mean, we, we are driven here. If we remove this, then we'll build um, peripheral fireplaces and, and this. And then it's interesting how he goes back to to the arrowheads he finds near the house. He, find, he goes back to the Native Americans who live there and he fantasizes that he would like to continue somehow a communitarian lifestyle that is beyond the familial uh, because he likes to have guests and sit around the fire in a circle. Um, and, and, and it's a very clear critique of the imposition of capitalism and with its you know, economy market driven um, discourse. In the apple tree table, um, the narrator finds a key in the garden and he discovers that that is a key to the attic that he has never been up to. And he discovers many things in the attic, especially a table, an apple tree table. He brings it down to the living room and um, to everybody's surprise, the table makes noises. <laughs> and they freak out. Ah! And then eventually the, a worm emerges from, from, from the wood of the uh, table um, because it's near the fireplace and with the worms, it, it, and, you know. And so it's, it's interesting because it's a moment of um, questioning of the familiar and the familial, the family disperses. And this is a reproduction of something that had happened to him before in the attic when he felt claustrophobia and he tried to emerge through a round window to catch air. And, and, and I think it's a very queer gesture of, yeah, everything's fine with this house, with this household. But the queer question is, is there, is there something else? Can I come out to another reality? And what would that reality be like? Those are the, the Millvillian questions again and again. And the last uh, story, Jimmy Rose, is uh, the story of a man who inherits a house who had belonged to a man named Jimmy Rose, who had a specific sensitivity um, and who loved the wallpaper with peacocks and roses. And again, everybody else believes that the, the wallpaper should be removed because it's about hens and um, artichokes. Uh, I mean, they, they kind of like uh, make the wallpaper unpoetic. <laughs> and, uh, and he, again, uh, he defends the wallpaper because he establishes this connection with another um, understanding of, of the domestic. Uh, I could go on and on, but I'm, I'm, we're super tired and we want to go home. Uh, so so uh, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to talk about my uh, work.